David. Um, indeed, it, we, we're living interesting times, and today we're going to talk about uh, cybersecurity, a topic that sometimes, um, I guess, in the context of more um, semantic wars, uh, and especially in the context of war in, in Europe and the war that we traditionally know about, we tend to to sometimes uh, not give it uh, the importance it needs or to sometimes forget it. Um, in 2021, I think it was uh, estimated that uh, uh, around $6 trillion were invested in cybersecurity around the world. And it's numbers that are now beyond our imagination, approximately. And the Israeli government said that there was a 20% increase of cyber attacks in, in Israel in the past year, um, mainly um, targeting civilians and, um, and not necessarily critical infrastructure as we may imagine it. Today we have with us uh, Guy Philippe Goldstein, who is a researcher on cyber defense, a consultant and a fiction writer. He's a lecturer at Ecole de Guerre Economique de Paris on cyber power and contributes to the academic journal of the INSS in Tel Aviv on cyber defense topics. He's also an advisor for Price Waterhouse Coopers on issues such as, such as cyber defense uh, on corporate valuation and management uh, or the future of cybersecurity. And he's as well an advisor on Expon, uh, to Expon Capital, a VC fund based in Luxembourg. He has been named one of France's top 100 talents in cyber by Usine Nouvelle, a national business magazine. And his acclaimed novel, Babel Minute Zero, is a forward thinking look at the role of cyber war in global geopolitics that has been cited by um, our very former Israeli Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as an influence on him when the Israeli government developed the new foundations of our cyber directorate and cyber warfare um, over a decade ago. Guy Philippe has given talk, uh, talks in TEDx Paris, TEDx Athens, and was a keynote speaker in Tel Aviv University Cyber Week. His writings appeared in Haaretz and Le Monde, and he also frequently contributes to I-24 News and the Israeli Public Radio. And without introduction, without further ado, let's, let's dive in. Um, when we talk about cyber and Israel, um, Guy Philippe, what, what does everybody immediately thinks about Israel? What is Israel and cyber? How does how did Israel become this cyber superpower? It's it's uh, thanks to introduction, thanks for invitation, and delighted to be here. Evidently, um, it's quite a fascinating story, I must say, uh, that had this bizarre chance to actually uh, assist and, and observe um, that actually has roots about thirty years ago, at a time where already you know Israel, but not only Israel, evidently the United States, and also perhaps another you know, couple of, uh, of advanced Western European, European countries, and also perhaps also Russia, started to think that there's something about these new IT systems that do have vulnerabilities. And when you hit at them, well, then maybe sometimes you can actually achieve uh, military political effects by actually weakening uh, those systems and perhaps then go into either espionage or sabotage. Uh, but then what happened uh, with Israel is actually, to some extent, a twofold movement. Um, initially, um, there was the whole development of actually the so-called startup nation uh, that really took hold by the 1990s, uh, that helped actually to develop further bonds between the US and Israel with regards to money being invested and development of IT and technology and so forth. And parallel to that, tracking to that, evidently, there's always been this um, edge uh, researched by Israel in terms of you know, qualitative advance with regards to military offensive and defensive systems. And evidently, as I mentioned, starting, say, in the 1990s, this interest, curiosity to push forward into this whole realm of IT security that has then turned into cyber. Uh, so there's been a, a first, say, movement um, kind of at low pace, say in the uh, 1990s and the 2000s, we've actually already a couple of very interesting uh, cybersecurity companies uh, from Israel, such as Checkpoint, for example, uh, or even then later Ciota, by, uh, funded by Naftali Bennett, and a couple of others, some that did make their way into the NASDAQ and so forth. But then and you know, that's where the whole story with my uh, little novel you know, came about. Uh, by 2010, uh, there had been this moment of, of thinking um, to really 
ask the question at the government level, actually at the level of Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, asking you know, this whole thing of cyber, how big it needs to be, and how much of a governmental push that needs to happen in Israel to maintain the qualitative edge and perhaps even to develop actually advantages you know, both on military side, but also why not on an economic side in the development of a, actually a startup, um, a cyber security startup ecosystem. So, and, and there's, there was actually at that time uh, a sort of commission, Blue Ribbon Commission set up by Professor Atzrak Ben Israel, who had been, um, who's was still then uh, the head of the Israeli Space Agency, who had, was the former head of MAFAT, the Israeli equivalent of uh, DARPA, um, an important guy, important person uh, within you know, the whole uh, Israeli military right. uh, ecosystem, a very smart person indeed. Um, happened that uh, there was this interest by Prime Minister Ntenu, who had actually visited Unit A200, which is the cyber offensive unit uh, on the military side, that started you know, to, to beg question in terms of, okay, what can be the advantage, but also what can be the vulnerabilities for Israel. And then, so the little story is that, uh, that, that actually Ben Israel told me that, and, and that even Nathaniel uh, told publicly is that, uh, so there was this ongoing conversations, this commission with about 80 people uh, to think about what are we going to do with cyber, but you know, the issue of some commissions that sometimes we laid out a very beautiful report with a nice ribbon and then it stays on the shelves and nothing happens. There, uh, it seems that um, uh, Ben Israel gave, so that novel I've written, uh, Babel Mizzo, that had been published and translated into Hebrew and published in Israel, uh, to be read to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. It seemed to have had a bit of an impact on Netanyahu. The novel is about a conflict between China and the United States for the control of Taiwan taking place in large part in cyberspace. And that plus, of course, all the other elements and all the capabilities that had already been developed in Israel, all that kind of converged into important decisions publicly taken in August 2011 to set up the Israeli National Cyber Bureau at the time. Uh, that's on the civilian side, the development of a very important uh, cybersecurity civilian agency in Israel. Um, and then probably also some decisions on the military side in terms of arbitrage between how much money we're going to pour further into offensive, defensive, cyber military. Okay, so, and, yeah. and, and just to finish off you know, this, you know, then you know, lots of things then happen over the last 10 years, but you know, the, the end point today, if we look at the situation, um, it's quite telling. I just give you one figure, which to me sums it up in terms of importance of, of cyber for Israel. By the way, so in 2011, at the moment of announcement of all those programs, at the moment of the first actually cyber conference uh, in Tel Aviv, where I'd been invited, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu at that time had made the bet that Israel should become one of the top five cyber powers in the world. Okay. Now, 11 years later, what do we see? Just, okay, one figure. If you look last year at the uh, investment in uh, cyber security, VC funding into uh, cyber security startups globally, perhaps there are different figures, but around 30 to 40% of all that funding worldwide has gone to Israeli startup, cyber security startups. Uh, then you know, there may be 40 to 50 percent that went to US ones, and then the rest is really the rest of the world. And that tells you, in a nutshell, just in one figure, the importance today of uh, cybersecurity for Israel and actually of Israeli cybersecurity for the rest of the world. So, with that amazing figure and with the, the decade long development, um, one of the biggest uh, conversations on cyber today is basically how Israel defends and also allegedly, according obviously to foreign, foreign media, as we, as we say here in Israel, um, uh, does um, use cyber as an offensive tactic. Um, and uh, one of the biggest threats to Israel um, is obviously Iran. So, how do you see this kind of the Iranians like to call it tit for tat, but uh, it doesn't usually the tat doesn't usually get to the the, the level of uh, the Israeli tit. But um, um, how do you how do you see that relation in the cyber in the cyber realm between Israel and Iran? 
So, you know, by the way, there's a bit of tax still, but you know, we'll, we'll get back to the importance of the Israeli, uh, the dominance of the Israeli side. Um, but indeed, as I just mentioned, there had been this kind of change in terms of thinking of national security and what are the new tools that can be of use for Israel to try to fight off, fight off the Iranian threat, you know, at the moment where, you know, there is this underlying uh, negotiations and there's the need to evidently uh, show strength and also to always, always uh, um, reaffirm deterrence or what we could call some sort of cyber deterrence. But when we'll get into the details, we'll see that it's a bit more complex than that. Um, there has been actually right now, so people talk a lot and with reason of what's going on between uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine with regards to cyber, but actually there has been this open front for the last now two years and a half between Iran and Israel that started off in April 2020 when some Iranian hackers tried to actually change the level of chlorine in water treatment plants in Israel, which uh, to a large extent was really uh, um, putting at risk uh, civilian life uh, um, and lots of you know, dangerous consequences from that. And then the response by Israel, to my point of view, has been quite stunning. Because about two weeks later, after this attempt that hopefully failed, but that could have had you know, major consequences in terms of human lives and, and so forth. Um, two weeks later, there had been the hack of a terminal operating system of the Shahid Raji uh, uh, port terminal in Bandar Abbas. And Bandar Abbas is a very important port for Iran. That's where you have 90% of all the port containers traffic you have also a bit of military traffic coming in and out of Bandar Abbas, okay? Allegedly. Uh, allegedly. Uh, well, yeah, easy to imagine. Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing here, and, and I really want to stress that. So the hack happened, then all of a sudden, uh, the whole infrastructure, the port infrastructure, the, the railroad infrastructure was totally overwhelmed. There had been allegedly, you know, queuing of you know over many kilometers and kilometers of boats uh, that just could not unload any longer, you know, all the containers. Everything was just uh, frozen and and out of whack. Uh, what is fascinating in this example is that typically when you think about a sophisticated hacking operation, it may take weeks, not even even you know months, to be set up. Now you have actually. A, an example of something which was nerdy, you know, I press the button and here we go. And the gut feeling is that it, it had to wait for two weeks to have perhaps, perhaps the okay by the Americans at the time that the Israeli would retaliate that way, supposedly. So the, and the very itself is actually quite strange. Now, so this is the opening move where you have something that is started by Iran, but then you have this very strong uh, reprisal by Israel, which by the way, by the way, in terms of norms and behaviors, on one hand, the Iranian try to do something that could have actually had very material uh, impacts on human lives. Okay, in terms of humanitarian targets, something which should be absolutely avoided. On the other hand, the Israelis, when, the, when supposedly they were behind the act against Shail Raji, what did they target add? They target an economic uh, target, but nothing that could have had humanitarian consequences. But that's also a way to show that, you know, we are able to retaliate in a very strong way and preserving also demo liberal democratic and humanitarian values, not like the other side. Okay. But then what happened is that indeed Israel and Iran went into this type of ping pong, if you allow me the expression, um, because there had been then some sort of retaliation by actually ransomware criminal cyber groups, one being called Fox Kitten, that try and manage, unfortunately, to hack a couple of large uh, Israeli companies like Elal, like Clalit, like Elbit, uh, even Partnox, which is a, a cybersecurity company. So they, they try to do a bit of havoc, uh, supposedly for you know, ransomware, you, know, you pay the ransom and you get back the information, which is not what happened. 
basically it was creating this level of nuisance as a sort of let's respond to that okay but then and that continue all through the course of the year 2021 but then again the israelis supposedly supposedly according to, media, to that's how we... yeah yeah was, well, what, what some media would say uh were able to uh you know again show some sort of uh, i would say um uh, superiority or, or edge in terms of dominance of that, of that field uh there is a couple of what happened was a couple of very interesting cyber attacks one was i believe in uh june where lots of railroad systems of public rail, uh, um, railroad not for freight but for for personal travels were actually hacked with, you know, on all the signs and posts, you know, if you have an issue with a train which is not coming, please call this number, which happened to be the number of Hali Ramene, the Supreme Guide of the Revolution, okay? Um, and then in perhaps a politically more astute or, or a hard way uh, in uh, October of last year, there had been this hack against uh, 4,300 gas stations where all of a sudden it became quite difficult you know, to access, you know, you know, to get at the pump and, and, and to get your gas. Uh, at the time, which was actually the two year anniversary of uh, an uprising that happened in 2019, in October 2019, because of price of oil, which was way too expensive. Okay. So these were like hard pinpoints and messages sent probably to the regime. But actually, a very bizarre uh, group called Predatory Sparrow. So lots of question marks around this Predatory Sparrow. And a uh, last remaining very interesting uh, attack actually happened um, uh, in the first part of this year. Because then you had some sort of, again, as I told you, it's very hard to say is deterrence being achieved here. Because then you had had actually a hack against a municipal uh, uh, siren alert uh, in Elat in Jerusalem that all of a sudden went uh, went on, uh, creating a little bit of panic in those two cities. A little bit of panic because things were able to be you know very quickly stopped. But still, an example that perhaps the Iranians uh, were also trying to find out the targets that people didn't think about, and then another very major uh, demonstration, still by those supposedly uh, predatory sparrow folks, against three steel plants in Iran, where actually they took control of the uh, um, internal videos in the uh, video uh, circuit. And so filming what was happening, were able to actually show how supposedly remotely, they were able to increase temperature in the steel mills and then actually have fire and explosion within them. So these are another examples, and I'll say a show of strength of very advanced technical capabilities and the ability to really break from inside uh, industry, which happen to be actually the uh, steel monopolies of Iran. And again, very hard messages, which are being sent to some extent, to the Iranian leadership that you know, those predatory sparrow are able to do very sophisticated things. And by the way, the last point, which is interesting with the predatory sparrow, yeah. um, is that in the messages they sent, they really stressed out that they did all this explosion at the moment where there was no one uh, on the floor so you know the type of hackers which are very careful about having non-combatant victims usually it's some specific hackers that not necessarily belongs to so typical criminal in groups. that in that exact context and in that very beautiful show of strength from both sides i have to admit it's a very nice show to watch right um what is so we it's something that is it's, it's beyond our, our, our imagination sometimes of what is actually cyber warfare and what does actually create a war because we see that in the european context right now when the tank crosses a border that's an act of war um so how, how do you define because if for example um uh, iranians will target a hospital in israel and the hospital will stop functioning or something like that is that an act of war or if because if a missile hits a hospital that's definitely something that you would retaliate with with uh, you know full of strength but here you're 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 giving examples that if that the, these attacks were were more 
concrete and not in the cyber world, this a, a, a real war would have started, a traditional one. Everything's possible, by the way. Uh, but to some extent, what we call conflicts, because, you know, are we into war? At the end of the day, that's in the eye of the beholder. That is, if the party which is being attacked decides to call that a war, and if indeed the effects, the human or economic effects, does cross a certain threshold that can be understood by other allied countries as indeed being sufficiently hard, uh, creating sufficient pain that indeed it's you know an element of attack that can be then that can justify what would be then use of force. Then yeah, in that context, you can then you know reply by use of force and engage into uh, an escalation that would trigger in, a war. But what so I really want to stress, I want yeah. to stress two things. A, those cases have already been defined by the Tallinn Manual. Okay, which is a very important Western effort to really uh, stress that all the law of armed conflicts do apply to this new field. And by the way, this is something that we in the West really stress out, while you know, some of the other countries you know, on the other side you know, want to avoid such a clear determination that the laws of, of, of um, armed conflicts, you know, uh, the law that you know, to trigger war and the way you're going to conduct war during war operations, all that do apply to that new field created by cyber weapons. But, in, and to your point and your question, at the end of the day, to decide if indeed what is happening elevates to the situation of, say, an armed conflict, to some extent, that's still in the eye of the beholder, that's still in the eye of the defender. And there's here some leeway with the political decider. That is, if the impacts are not so dire, okay, and the, uh, the defending country decides that it's not the right moment to engage into this or that conflict, but then maybe you're just going to sustain the blow uh, and not say much about it. And uh, by the way, I've seen that in Europe, okay? How, because it's also sometimes a bit challenging to prove the perpetrator in cyber world? It has been, okay, that the whole issue of attribution has been a big issue. Now, what we've seen over the last, say, five, seven years is that if you have enough time, you are able to create, you know, the right level of evidence that can at least convince you know, in your own institutions, but also, and that is the most important thing, your allied countries that indeed this is country X that has attacked you. And we have seen since 2014, 2015, a couple of very nice uh, demonstration by way by uh, the US Department of Justice and FBI, probably with the help of other US institutions that indeed you can provide the evidence, you can actually you know, pinpoint the very officers in Iran, in China, in Russia that are beyond this and that attack. And that again, by the way, it's another show of force in this on information field. If you're able to show this is that very guy, you know, with that ranking, you know, who belongs to that family and so forth, who is behind this attack. And on the other side, you know, the Iranian, the Chinese, the Russian cannot right. provide. These are the Israeli guys or the American guys, you know, who are doing the same. You win the competition to some extent. So as you say, some some actors or countries have more capabilities than others, either to be offensive or even to prove they were attacked. So in that sense, some sort of cyber cooperation needs to happen. And and as we know, like historically, Israel is an actor that usually acts alone and doesn't like to necessarily share. Or you know, the, we we stand alone, and it's, it's it's a sentence that I've been heard um, quite a lot. Is in cyber is it is it different, or is there more space for Israel to cooperate? Okay. It is very much different, um, at least on the defensive side. The offensive, you know, you go back in the realm of sabotage and specific espionage. And here, you know, cooperation doesn't happen necessarily because you know, each one does his, its own things. From, I mean, I say that I'll give them a canonical example of actually important collaboration that happened between 
US, Israel, but also Germany, probably France and Britain, with regards to Stuxnet, which was the infamous uh, worm uh, triggered against the Natham's plant uh, for uh, enriched uranium in Iran, okay, between 2007 and 2010. And actually, we know now that that had been actually a full you know, European, US, Israeli cooperation to some extent to try to wreak havoc from the inside within the centrifuges in Natanz. But this is a bit exceptional, right? Because that was part of actually of a collaborative uh, operation to force the Iranians to come to the GCPOA. Okay. Now, in terms of defensive side, and this is where you do have a sea change. And by the way, this is something I've been saying uh, back in Israel in 2011. That's also something that the first cyber commander, Danny Bryan, uh, who got in function in 2012, used to say in terms of building some sort of NATO cyber. Okay. And that's, you know, to my surprise, and that not so surprising when you understand the field, what actually I've been hearing by the Israelis, and actually, uh, and, and, and I think this is very pertinent, um, the, Nas the National Cyber Directorate and all the institutions today in Israel are really forthcoming in terms of trying to develop cooperation with other cybersecurity civilian agencies across the world, at least those that actually share the same values to the point of what we seen last year, um, where actually it was pitched by then Igal Una, who was the head at that time of uh, National Cyber Direct, and even actually then uh, Prime Minister Nathalie Bennett, in terms of global cybernet, which is the network of cooperation between um, cybersecurity specialists in Israel that could open up to other countries in the US, in Canada, uh, in Germany, in, in, in other European countries that do share the same values you know, in terms of liberal democracies as Israel. And that itself is very interesting because it's really Israel this time now promoting cooperation. I would say, you know, there's this very important saying uh, in Spider-Man, with great powers comes great responsibilities. And- It's been a while since I've heard this thing. quote, and especially it's, not in it's, cyber. It's, it's a key one. I must <laughs> say that to some extent, that is to me the expression of the rich in terms of cyber power that Israel has actually attained. That is, they understand, at least lots of guys there, understand that they have reached so much level of getting the information, perhaps probably sharing the information, that they are doing to me what is the really right move, that is to open up cooperation with other, uh, other countries. And what I, I'd say, maybe I'll finish on that, is that this opens up fantastic strategic perspective for Israel in a field which is already extremely important. So you mentioned the importance of cybersecurity. So, so this is the cost of cybersecurity, which may be around six trillions, and then there's market itself, which may be, who knows, $150, $200 billion a year. But beyond that, the story is not over yet. And I'll finish on that. We are moving fast you know, in a very quick pace toward a robotization of our society. The world that will contemplate 10 years from now will be fully different, completely different from the world we're living today with way more you know, captors, uh, sensors, internet of things, but also way more robots. We see that with the declining cost of industrial grade robots with way more actually capabilities to understand and simulate the world via digital twins. So what I mean to say is that this is just but the start of the story right now in 2022. You project out 10 years or 15 years from now, the world will be even more, you know, overwhelmed by cyber and by, sorry, by digital transformation. And what that means is that if you are one country that helps to provide security in that realm, you will achieve a very, very interesting position of influence. So, you know, the, 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 I'll just finish on that the whole expression of Dutch qualitat or Swiss made, you know, for industrial quality. Now, we're moving in a world where quality is going to be the quality of the code. And if you have one country that can provide security for the code, that's going to be the equivalent for the 21st century of Dutch qualitat, Dutch qualitat or Swiss made. So, so these I are very interesting perspectives in you terms of very curious. development and, of course, of power and influence. 
So before I ask, I ask you my last question, and also um, everybody, please, please feel free to submit your Q and A's uh, regularly as in the chat. Um, the robotization of our society, and as you mentioned, and who holds the code behind it, it's been a big debate in Europe in the past few years, especially with the main provider of all of the chips and the, and the nanotechnology, which is China, the big elephant in the room, and the one you addressed in your book over a decade ago. Um, and Huawei in the UK was a very big debate, and even in Germany and in France as well. Um, is, is China cooperating? Is China holding some sort of code behind? Is, uh, do, how, how is the China-US? Is the, I'm just going to drop name drop the splinter net thread that we have around us. How, how does this go into everything? I mean, yeah, history is a funny way to bounce back because uh, as I, I told you, the novel initially was about this story between China and the US for the control of Taiwan and taking place in cyberspace. And now, you know, 15 years later, you know, there's a bit of deja vu to me, at least. What is quite obvious um, to me, at least, but this is a bit of another side conversation, but we are moving fast ahead towards some sort of Cold War 2.0 where we are going to build at least two blocks, one around you know, our Western uh, world based on our liberal democratic values with lots of friends in the Indo-Pacific side and in Europe and in US and with Israel and so forth. Um, and then on the other side, we'll have China, perhaps with other type of countries, we'll see where Russia will end up you know, uh, in one or two or three years from now. Um, but at any rate, uh, we are seeing a splitting up of the technological world that is granted. I mean, it was really quite obvious already for some time because you know in the West nobody buys uh, Chinese cybersecurity stuff, okay? Anymore. And were and 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 then we had the debate around five G, but that debate actually has been set. Uh, in the US, in Europe, you know, and elsewhere across the world that belongs to that same block. Okay, we'll have the same issue actually with uh, robotization, with right. AI driving or piloting part of that robotization. My gut feeling is that in as much as the first Cold War was really about, you know, different type of ideologies, communism uh, and, and, and capitalism, that new Cold War will have a bigger technological element because basically at the end of the day, it's going to be very hard to buy stuff say coming from China because that stuff will be integrated with code. And if you don't understand that code or if that code does not um, have the same ethical guidelines as it is thought of actually right now in terms of ethical AI, you will not be able to buy it. And we may see this split, okay? But again, so that means that at the end of the day, we'll have, to me, at least one big Western block where a lot of your know, countries, hopefully sharing the same liberal democratic values will be able to prosper. And with places for Israel and all the other friends of Israel to you know, develop uh, a sane and, and safe, actually, uh, ecosystem and, and economy.